Yes, here we are again. And it's our turn to be hot. We've been in the mid to high 90s for three days, four days in a row, and I think we got three more until it breaks. And we'll be down in the low 80s again. Uh, good weather, I suppose, for Labor Day. Of course, I don't really labor anymore. I'm just an old man, but <clears throat> I still get to labor for the Lord. It's not actually like I'm doing work with my hands or feeling any sort of stress. Boy, I got a belly full of sausage and eggs. You know, we all saving as much money as we can, and I bought some Walmart sausage. I usually buy name brand sausage, but uh, I like Earl Campbell sausage, as you know. Yeah. Number 34. Love you, Blue. You know, uh, <clears throat> you have to be old to remember what that means. Earl Campbell was one of the greatest running backs of all time. He's in the Hall of Fame. He was, uh, well, during most of the time he was at the Houston when they were the Oilers. It was Earl Campbell and the rest of the team for the first couple of years. And then Bum Phillips figured out what to do with him, and they, they had a run. They had a run at the AFC Championship every year. But, you know, during that time, Bradshaw was in Pittsburgh, and the Steelers were always in the way. Um, I'm glad you're here. It's uh, Tuesday morning. We're going to be going down to Marionville to meet with pastor from Wheelerville and some other guys. I'm going to see the pastor from Shiloh Baptist Church, which is there as the crow flies between Hurley and Marionville, and uh, try to encourage those men, if we can, do the best we can, we'll break bread, and uh, I hope we break more than bread, but if that's all we got to break, we'll break it. <laughs> <laughs> I slept a lot yesterday in a, a series of naps because I was tired from Sunday, but I still got a lot done. I was able to go to the church and uh, and we did some prep work uh, about half the afternoon. We did prep work on a revival. We're going to start at Victory Baptist Church in Ozark, down on how down on Highway W. That starts on the that starts on the eighth of September, Sunday, the eighth of September. So we hope that you are able. To come to that, if you're close, please come. Don't interrupt the uh, shindig at your own church, but you, if you don't have church on Sunday night, we'll be there from Sunday morning, the 8th, through the Wednesday, the 11th, uh, evening services. Evening services at 6, and the morning service at Victory is at 11. And no, 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 it's not. It's at 10. Good morning, Gala. There she goes now. Uh, there she goes again. See, everything reminds me of a song. Uh, my, I apologize for that. Sometimes, you know, the the soundtrack never quits quits in my head. I I played music and listened to music for so long that it's just there. It don't ever go away. I like the word that we don't use anymore. It is indelible. I mean, it's, it's clear, clearly visible and, and audible upon my brain. Now, we're getting to the end of Chapter 3 of Second Thessalonians today. And so I believe it deserves to read through. We've got three verses left. We're going to be talking about peace. Peace. My peace I give unto you, you know. Peace be still, peace be still. Now, I don't even know if that's the tune to that, but there's a song called Peace Be Still. You know, that's what Jesus said when he calmed the sea. You know, 
And we always need to remember that Jesus is not just a storm savior. In other words, saving us from the storm, delivering us from the storm. He's a storm stopper. <laughs> he, can, he, can have, he can have all the powers of hell raging against you. And you can go to the Lord in prayer and you can have others acting in your behalf and praying in your behalf. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning, Pam. And you can have other people praying for you too. And uh, uh, doesn't matter whether all the forces of hell and the world and the devil and the flesh, they're all raging against you. And Jesus can say, stop, peace, be still. He commands the sea and the wind, and they obey him. What manner of man is this? I'll tell you what manner of man he is. He's the God who lives forever, represented in the person of Jesus Christ, who died on an old rugged cross to save you and me from hell. And he's still about that business and will be until the rapture. So we need to we need to remember that. Uh, Pam Wells. When we were kids, she was Pam Gill, and she was a cheerleader at the Sam Houston Senior High School. She's one of my friends. I was so glad to see you. Pam, I don't know what happened to the other people in our class. They got old, but you and I still, you look young. I don't know what that is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Every time I see somebody my old, old age, I go, wow, look at that. Look at that old person. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly how that works. Chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, just to recap, beginning in the first verse. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. We have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother. Remember, we spent days talking about this. Not every person in the world, but everyone who calls himself a brother and by extension, a sister, a Christian, uh, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if ye any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. See, when people, when people have jobs, they don't have to get into your, they have time to get into your business or be gossips. <laughs> They're too busy working. <clears throat> now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. That is sound advice no matter what you do. Now that's, uh, that, that's down from the, from the, from the, from the floor sweeper to the greaser all the way up to the guy that runs the line. Doesn't matter. Uh, whoever you are, wherever you are, be grateful for the job you got. If you can get a better job, great. If you belong to a union and you can get better working conditions, that's good. But you know what? If you got a bad job, they have the world lined up to come here because they, they, would, they would sell their soul to have the bad job that you have. And somebody living on the street in Calcutta, their little their little piece of sidewalk that they're kind of assigned for life because they never have a home. If you live in a shack, they think you live in a mansion. So you see, we all got something to be grateful for. We need to eat. 
We need to eat our own bread and with quietness do our own work. In other words, don't raise a stink. Don't get in other people's business for no reason. Be content with what you have. Now, okay, let me do it. Chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. It's not far over. I just want to buttress that a little bit. I, uh, we've talked about this exhaustively, especially last week, um, where Paul is instructing Timothy not to get bogged down in money and possessions and worldly things and and letting people that have money who raw him and manipulate him he needs to stay true to Christ, stay true to the gospel. And he says He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. First Timothy six six. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Remember Paul in Philippians, when he was in a jail, he said, he said, I know how to abound, I know how to be abased. But, he says, I have learned to be content in whatsoever state I am. See, our contentment is Christ, and that's where I'm going with this. It's the peace that only Jesus can live. But ye, brethren, verse 13, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. In other words, bring him back. You know, you if he's your brother, and you tell him he's wrong, let him pout for a while. Let him get his life in order and let him come back to you. If he's really your friend, he's not going to hate you because he's wrong and you're right. If he's a Christian, he's not going to hate you because he's wrong and the Lord is right. It works both ways. And it actually it actually follows and helps define the first and second, the great commandments, you know. The lawyer said to G asked Jesus, he says, he says, Master, what is the greatest commandment of all? He says, He says, that thou shalt hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. So if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, not that he may be destroyed. Because look at verse 15. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother, and let his conscience and the, the Holy Ghost work upon him. Now, we're getting to the point where I think we're going to be able today to say goodbye to Second Thessalonians. I don't know where we will be tomorrow. I am torn. Here's a good King James word for you. I'm torn betwixt the twain. <laughs> it will either be the Old Testament, the book of the Old Testament prophet, Joel. Or if I'm feeling really, really, really ambitious at this time of the year, we may go and do Zechariah one of the two prophets of the return. They were the one, Haggai and Zechariah were the ones that encouraged and wrote during the times of Ezra and Nehemiah with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian captivity. I'm still praying on these things. So if you care about this program, and some of you do because you watch it all the time, Pray that Jimmy will choose correctly, but also pray that whichever one I choose, that God will give me the grace to teach it properly. Uh, you know, I don't go into these lessons without praying about it. And, and 
somebody told me when I was very young that, that when you read your Bible, you need to pray first. And when you go to study, you need to pray first. And what we're basically praying for when we sit down, either as a student or a teacher or all students together, because see, I'm not a scholar. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an ignorant and unlearned man. I'm just a poor man. So I'm a student. I'm not a scholar. I, I study the things that great men have written and I, I study the Bible. So I'm just a student. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a professor. But, uh, what we pray for is that, is that the Holy Ghost through his unique ministry that only the Holy Ghost could do can give us the understanding of the Word of God, whether we're receiving it or whether we're whether we're presenting it, you see, because it's the same God that works in each of us to achieve that. And it is all to his glory and his edification and the edification of each other. Uh, you really can't speak of edification in relation to God, except that we are constantly building up our vision of his glory. I guess you could say that we're edified in that regard. Now, Beginning in verse 16 of 2 Thessalonians. Now, as Paul is writing to them, now the Lord of peace himself, who would that be? That would be the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of peace. What does Isaiah name him 750 years before he's born? The Prince of Peace. Let's look at that. Where it's got all those names of the mighty God and everything that he's going to be when he comes. It says that, For unto us a child is born. It's uh, what, 9-6, Isaiah 9-6. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. You know, all children are born. But only one son was given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever, including me and you, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Praise God, the kingdom is going to come. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, hallelujah, and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face, I see. He's coming back. Coming back in glory. He's going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. He is going to rule with a rod of iron and we will reign with him as kings and priests for a thousand years. And he will be in charge forever. And the law shall go forth from Mount Zion. Oh, praise God. The Prince of Peace. Now the Lord of Peace himself give you peace always by all means. I like that. <laughs> The Lord be with you all. Well, let's just work work a little bit with that. The Lord of peace, you know, I first, I guess I was 12 years old when I read this for the first time for myself. I probably heard it preached before. I'm sure I did. I feel that, yeah, Gail, I feel that it is my duty as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up. Remember, that's what my job is, is to stir you up. Yeah, I remember being 12 years old. 
and it was sometime during the first semester of the seventh grade, I'd gone from grade school from Barrick to Patrick Henry for junior high. And I would come home overwhelmed by my classes. I'd get my homework done, and then in the evening, I'd lay there and read this Bible. And I remember first reading these words, and, and I said, man, I want that. I didn't realize I already had it because I got saved. That's why I had the Bible. Jesus saved me that summer during vacation Bible school. Verse 28 of chapter 11 of Matthew. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I, I thought I was really having a hard time with my piddly little school work, you know. Because it was so much harder than the sixth grade. When I was in the sixth grade, I was like top of the heap, you know. I was one of the big kids. I never was very big, but I was one of the older kids. And I, I just kind of cruised through the fifth and sixth grade because my reading level was far beyond most grade school levels, you know, and because I read all the time and had been since I was like seven. <laughs> I was always reading. And, uh, and, and, but I was overwhelmed. Now I was now I was the little fish in a big pond, and junior high was harder because at the end of every hour you had to go like go to your locker and get another book, and you had five minutes to do that and get back to the and, and get back to the next class, and then when the lunch came, if you didn't get there close to the first of the line, you only had like three minutes to eat your lunch. But the killer was is that if you ran. Then you'd get sent to the end of the line. They would hold you outside the cafeteria door until everybody else went in. So you was at the end of the line. And Mr. Freeman was in charge of that, the math teacher, you know. It's a very good man. I knew him some after I graduated, especially after my daddy died. And, uh, and uh, but, but he was a, a formidable man, and uh, he would jerk you out of the line if you were running. If he wasn't fast enough to catch you when you got inside, he would come in and pick you out of the line and put you at the back of it. You see, I was overwhelmed with stress by being in that new environment that I couldn't control, that I wasn't a top dog of her, you know, because I, you know, I had, had six years to figure out elementary school. Well, now here I am in the seventh grade, and it was a nightmare to me. And I read this and made a huge impression on me and stay with me for life. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And when you hear the word yoke, you think you got to go to work. That's uh, what they put on an oxen to pull the millstone or a load. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And then I read about him calming the sea also in Matthew. And how he could stop the storm. It was a big lesson to me that he could stop the storm instead of just getting you through it. There are times when you can say, Lord, I just can't take it anymore. I just don't think I can go on. I need help. And he can, and he has for me, and he will for you. Not every time, but when he thinks you're right. <laughs> he has mercy on us. He will stop the storm. He said in verse 16 of chapter 14 that when we studied John, we, we went through this verse by verse, of course. And so I would suggest that you can go back a year in YouTube on the YouTube channel. They're all archived under Jimmy Harris, two R's and two S's. And you can see that uh, you can go back to lessons on John in the upper room discourse. 
don't, I don't have time to re litigate that here, but I just want to remind you of some things that Jesus promises to the believer. He says to this, the disciples, he says, and I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another comforter. That's the Holy Ghost. That he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And he's promised them this comfort. And he also says in verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. And then he says in verse 27, and never forget that verse 17 says that the Holy Ghost is going to come. He's going to dwell in you. And he says, he says, he'll dwell with you and he will be in you. This was a new thing under the new covenant that we would have God, the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of us. And you might say, either taking the place of or arguing with our own conscience and our own deceitful hearts. You know, the scripture says about your heart. You, you know, in, in popular culture, they say, follow your heart. Well, don't do that because that'll get you in trouble because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jesus says in verse 27 of chapter 14 of John, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Praise God. You know, Jesus said at the end of chapter 16, he said 33 after he finishes their discourse, he says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. The whole reason for my teaching, friends, Jesus says, and you are my friends, that's what he was calling his disciples. But what he told them, he says, I'm talking to you this way so that you might have peace. What peace? The peace that only he can give, not as the world gives. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Verse 16, 2 Thessalonians 3. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by his means. Let's look back at Philippians. This is the description of that peace which passeth all understanding because it is a peace that is given by Christ and maintained by Christ. It's his peace. It's not our peace. It's his peace that he puts upon us. He says in verse 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, and with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then uh, verse 16 finishes with the Lord be with you all. I always, always think back, of course, to the 
the stating of the Great Commission in Matthew 28. You know, and lo, I am with you always. That's why I don't like flying on airplanes because Jesus not up there because he says, he says, lo, I am with you, <clears throat> not high. <laughs> now that's, don't believe that. That's not true. Your, your teacher is having a bit of very juvenile fun. Jesus says unto them in verse 18, he said, Matthew 28, he says, Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power. How much power? All power. Some power? No, all power. Now, can you dig that? <laughs> that is everything from soup to nuts. All of it. All power. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And here it is. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always, by all means, the Lord be with you all. And then Paul writes this, he says, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token of every epistle, so I write. Paul was struck blind on the road to Damascus. He recovered, but he never recovered fully. And by the end of his life, he was almost blind. Uh, the historians tell us that he wrote in giant letters, not so that his reader could see them, but so that he could see them. And that's why he had a scribe. That's why most of these things were written by, by Silas or by Silvanus or by Timothy or by Tychicus, by John Mark even. Some of these, these were written down by other men and sent out much like Jeremiah had to dictate the word of God to Baruch because Jeremiah was in prison and Baruch wrote outside the window of the prison or the gate of the prison the things that Jeremiah said excuse me <sighs> life is good I'm not necessarily, but life is good. I'm sorry, just a little, little off sometimes. You people who work with me and know me, you know that I, I kind of, I kind of get bright and get dim like a bulb in a DC system, you know. And you got to crank up the batteries, and then the bulb gets brighter. And if the if the steam is a steam engine or something, if it starts not taking enough turns for the generator, then the, the light dims. Then all of a sudden you crank up the generator and the light gets brighter again. You might have done a science project like that when you were a kid. I know I did. Because Daddy was an electrician. You could help me with it. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. And we look at the end of different epistles. We look at uh, you know, um, let's say the one I'm here, First Corinthians, I think, has a attribution. But it may not be First Corinthians, but I'm going to look anyway. We're not sure who wrote this one. Probably Timothy. But at the end of it, he says, The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. He, you know, somebody else probably wrote it out in normal size letters, and then Paul signed his name in big letters. And they would know that it was Paul because Paul couldn't see, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. 
his eyes just kept getting worse and worse. At the end of Ephesians, It appears that Tychicus was writing this one. At the end of Colossians, he signed the letter that that possibly John Mark himself wrote because he talks about Mark being there with him at the time of that letter. We go back to the root of this. He says, a salutation of Paul with mine own hand at Galatia. Galatia is the biggest deal. He, he says, you see how big a letter I've written with my own hand. Uh, it's not that he wrote a long letter because Galatians is not a long book. But I think when he talks about, you see how big a letter he's talking about, he wrote it himself. He had to write it that big so I could see it, so that he could see it. And he says, and you can see in verse 11 of Galatians, you, you see how large a letter I have written unto you in mine own hand. And just before that, in uh, chapter 4, he says that in verse 13 of chapter 4, he says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. You treated me just like it was Jesus talking to you. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. That's how much they used to love him. And then he says, this will happen to you if you stay anywhere long enough. They'll start hating you because they want to, they want to get back to sin and debauchery. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? <laughs> Paul begged God to heal him of this. We find out in chapter 12, 2 Corinthians. He said, and last verse seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He knew so much and had seen so much that he was afraid that people would worship him and God was sure that, that pride might swell up in him. That's why he gave him this ailment where he had to depend on other people to get the work done. See, Paul had to put his pride aside and trust other men to write this stuff down and to get these epistles out. There are 27 books in the New Testament. He wrote 14 of them. The only way he could do the work of God was to depend on other people to help him. Men and women alike. And he lists many of them in at the end of the book of Romans and several other places during the epistles.
I think this is why I'm not Dr. Harris. I think if I was Professor Harris or Dr. Harris, I'd be just insufferable. My pride, my big head would get the best of me. I would lord it over people. Because, see, when I was in showbiz, my whole deal was, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm doing this now. Watch me. Don't watch him. Watch me. It's infantile, but it's real nevertheless. And so Christ has broken me, and you, and I'm glad because, see, Christ cannot use a man or a woman until he has completely broken them to the point of complete surrender. It's just how it works. You see, I rely on him for everything. This ailment that Paul had in verse 8, he said, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. And do you remember how it first happened? I'm sure you do. Let's look at it. My mentor, when I first started preaching, he said, never assume they know the whole story. Verse 1, chapter 9 of the book of Acts. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there was shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prigs. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him unto Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple named Damasc uh, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he may receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scaled, and he received sight forthwith and rose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened and 
was Paul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And that's why he wrote in such a large hand and had somebody else write the letters and he signed them with his own signature, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write. And grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The one who destroyed the faith turned into the one who begged the known world, the entire known world, to accept the faith. He begged Asia. He begged Europe. He begged all of Rome. Of course, only a few ever accept the gospel. Only a few believe. Many are called, but few are chosen. At the end of his life, when he was nearly blind, had to have somebody with him all the time. And he was in jail. And he knew that he was going to die. You know what his prayer was? Because of Jesus, because the Lord was with him, because the Lord had given him peace always. Because the Lord has sustained him in all of his infirmities and all his trials. In First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 he says, I hope I can say it. I'll turn over there just in case I have to look. He said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. With faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause. I obtain mercy. I can say that about myself. That in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering. Me who was a drunk and a cheat. For a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul had been a witness of the grace of God for nearly 2,000 years. For whatever time we have on earth, we need to be a witness of the grace of God by being filled with and showing to the world the peace of God, which passeth all understanding.